You're listening to Oilers Nation Radio, presented by The Nation Network. Subscribe for free on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Thank you very much, Lisa. Oilers Nation Radio, episode 141. I am Bag Milk here with Rick, Nation Dan, Tyler Remchuk. We are going to break down the world of the Edmonton Oilers. It's only been a few days since we last spoke to you. But it's going to be interesting to see if the boys have calmed down since then. It's been a couple of days. We'll get into it. First, I want to thank our friends at Sherwood Ford the Giant. Check them out on Twitter at Sherwood Ford and on Instagram at Sherwood Ford underscore the Giant. They've got all the whips and service and everything vehicle related you could ever need in your life. Just make your way out, give them a call, send them an email, hit them up on Twitter. They'll answer you, whatever your question may be. Maybe you can get yourself into one of them sexy, sexy Broncos that I keep asking about. Again, four. We just need four. I imagine that won't cost anything at all. Four brand new Broncos, that's very little money, I'm sure. All right. I'll give you four extra plugs on the podcast if you supply us with four Broncos. Sold! That's the trade. That's the trade. As we do every week, my friend Tyler Yamchuk will lead us off with the Sherwood Ford Giant Question of the Week. Yes, the Sherwood Ford Giant Question of the Week. We are transitioning and pivoting into off-season mode here on Oilers Nation Radio. Very sad, but uh, personally, like the hockey nerd side of me, I love this time of year. Like I could talk rumors and trade proposals. I kid you not for like three hours a day. So I'm a little bit excited to to ramp up the off-season talk. And that starts with the Sherwood Ford Giant Question, which is... What is the biggest need for the Edmonton Oilers this off season? Dun-dun. I will open the table who open the floor. I should say who wants to jump in first. They need a scoring winger. They need yeah. scoring. They need to score more <laughs> goals. They need more players in different parts of their lineup that can score goals, score goals. That's how they would have beaten the Winnipeg Jets. If they would have scored more goals, how do you score more goals? You acquire players who can say it with me, score goals. Find goals, find goal scoring score, wingers, score. baby. Goal That's score. it. That is priority one. Find goals and players who can score them. Uh, before I move on to the other boys in there, like, yes, they need secondary scoring. Ken Holland admitted it was a problem in his presser. We're gonna get to get the we're gonna get to the Holland presser as well. Um, how do they make it happen though, Tyler? There's interesting names on the free agent market. And the other thing that's going to work in the Oilers' favor, and this is something people who listen to the podcast and all this stuff are probably going to hear me saying a lot, but they have cap space and they have a really good expansion situation. What Ken Holland needs to do is weaponize that, find the teams with no cap space, find the teams that have expansion problems and take advantage of them. So I think whether it's through trade or through free agency, there are there's a long list of names that are out there and that would contribute and score goals for the Edmonton Oilers. He might need to get creative, but there are plenty of ways Ken Holland can go with this. I kind of think about it like um, <clears throat> I look at a guy like Taves in Colorado. You know, yeah. Colorado made a trade for Taves in that exact situation. So you have to imagine with a flat cap and plenty of teams up against it, looking at puckpedia.com, that you'd have to think that there's a possibility for that. No, I think so. Like the Oilers heading into next season are going to have around whatever it is, $20 million in cap space or more. If they find a way to move some stuff out or go the buyout way, there's going to be money for them to spend on free agents. And when you look at the core of this team and the amount of prospects they have in their system, they got some picks coming up, not necessarily in this year's draft, but next year's draft. There is moves to be made, assets to be spent, both money and in terms of like organizational assets. There's plenty of ways Ken Holland can go to get it done. Mr. That Daniel. 20 million, that 20 million gets eaten up really quick though when you like re-sign Larson and Nuge, no? So if you re-sign, uh, well, we can get into that after we get to the short four giant question because I've laid out some numbers on uh, all yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Nation Dan, your biggest need for the Edmonton Oilers in 21-22. Well, I think says. Tyler... I think Tyler took the the big one off the board, but for me, uh, a slightly secondary option that we're going to need to look at is our goalie. So by the sounds of Ken Holland's press conference, Mike Smith is coming back. And for me, you know, while the dream of Mike Smith having another, you know, Vesna conversation worthy season is, is still there and you can't until he shows signs of otherwise, you've got to, You've got to give him that credit. We need to go out and find a goalie that could replace him in uh, in the situation that he does fall off that cliff this year, um, especially if we do get rid of Miko Koskinen, which I think is the 
overwhelming plan. So for me, it's, it's getting a goalie into this situation where we do truly have a one, a one B situation going into the season. And then, you know, the goalies can kind of fight it out between them as to, uh, as to who's the one a and who's the one B. We'll be interesting to see what happens in that respect because Ken Holland did his presser. We're going to talk about it again. Uh, but then he jumped on Stoffer's show and he kind of said, why couldn't I bring back the same tandem next year? They were good for us. We'll get into that in a little bit as well. Rick, biggest need. Uh, well, I'm going to say Tyler hit it with the, uh, with the, uh, with the scoring winger there. I think someone that can just kind of snipe uh, whether he plays with Connor or Leon is uh, a huge advantage. Uh, gets him that five on five scoring we missed out on. But um, right behind that, I do believe is some, some depth in the bottom six in terms of scoring though, we've always done this. We've always wanted this. I honestly, we came in last year, we brought in a, a veteran who for the most part, everybody said, you know, is ultimately positive about going in, Like, you know what? I what think this about? is going to work. Tourists. Oh. <laughs> it was, a, it was, it turned out, it turned out bad. It turned out uh... bad, right? But going in, if we can pull up all the footage from back then, there was technically going in on paper was supposed to be a good thing. He was supposed to be able to do all these things. It was supposed to be good in the, you know, in the dressing room and whatnot. Ultimately, it did not work out. But I want to see him somehow do that thing again. Get us that, I don't know, that Joe Thornton type of guy who can lead, who can still produce in the bottom, who's, you know, has a lot of tools in the toolbox. I think we have a couple of guys who are... And I would he's bring not him yeah. That's not I happening. Mean, you know, well, that's fair, but I mean, like someone like that would be great. Um, I'd still t- oh no, he's probably too old now, Corey Perry. But that type of a player, I, that's kind of what I think would what it really help right now because I think a lot of guys in our top, in our bottom six are too specialized. Like they don't have a, a wide range of um, skills, so we kind of get uh, we kind of get narrowed in on what they can do out there. I, I guess my answer is just going to be a different flavor of the same answer, I suppose, but the bottom six has to be better. It has to be rebuilt. They look at the series against Winnipeg and how often the bottom six just, they were, they got nothing done, nothing. And I, that wasn't just in the playoffs. It was all year. There was no goals coming from there. I mean, there was, there was a couple, but like you have a fourth line that has $11 million on it. That's not going to do anything. So can you upgrade on Chase on? I don't know. Maybe he comes back. I have no idea. What's going to happen with Neil? I don't know. But you need better players in the bottom six. What we saw when Holland, or not Holland, Tippett added more speed into the series in games three and four, they just looked better. They just looked better. I don't know why that wasn't the default plan, but they need to rebuild the bottom six so that the goal of them being on the ice isn't just to hang on for dear life and hope nothing happens. There was a lot of that where it's like Connor and Leon are going to be fine. They're going to be great. But when they're not on the ice, it was a disaster. And that just can't be, that can't be the case. That can't be the case. So kind of the same flavor as what Tyler said, maybe some veterans though, like veterans that have been here before. Like I hate to pump Toronto's tires here, although they lost last night, but they've got veterans throughout their lineup that have been there and done it before. Um, and I'd like to see the Oilers do a little bit more of that. I had no problem. We talked about it a lot, signing scratch tickets, five, six, seven guys, hoping something works out. I want to move away from that and kind of look at locking in guys that can actually contribute, that we know can contribute, not hope that can contribute, that we know that they can. I think a guy that came in and fit in in a bottom six role, as an example, was Devin Shore. Yep. You know, he's a player that down there, I think you just bring him back because he fits down there. He does the things that you want from a bottom six guy, a fourth line guy, and he can score. He can score a little bit and he can kill penalties. But for a lot of others, I mean, we saw Joachim Nygaard sign a six year deal. He did absolutely zero anytime he played for the Oilers. He was, he skated 100 miles an hour, but he didn't get anything done apart from that. Although he did draw a lot of penalties. He drew a lot. Him and Haas, man, they'd come in and like draw two penalties in two games and they'd be healthy scratch for like another month and then come in and draw like three more penalties and then be done. So I think my answer then would be to fill your bottom six out with guys that can do it, that we know can do it. Not just fishing in Europe and crossing your fingers and hoping for the best. I don't know if that's possible or doable, but based on the flat cap, there's going to be deals out there to be had. And 
considering the Oilers do have some cap space, and I know Tyler's going to run through some numbers on what that looks like, yeah. uh, I think it's doable. I think it's doable. So yeah, if you I, got I an, so well. if you got an answer too, I want to I want you to hit us up Owen Radio Podcast Twitter and Instagram. I want to know what is the Oilers' biggest need headed into the off season. I want to know your answers beyond depth scoring. Beyond depth scoring, maybe it's something else that we haven't even thought about. Maybe you're just not happy with the defense. Elliot Friedman t- said today on Thirty One Thoughts podcast he's not expecting Tyson Berry to come in. Maybe you'd feel more comfortable with getting another right shot defenseman that adds a little bit of competition even though we got bouchard up in the wings i don't know let us know owen radio podcast sorry tyler i cut you off no i was just gonna say it's entirely possible and what's what's enticing about this upcoming season here is one the flat cap could create something like we saw last year where there's good free agents willing to take or being forced to take short-term deals there's a real chance the oilers could get tyson berry 2.0 but it's actually you know a left winger who they're gonna say hey Listen, your value's not high. Take a one-year deal, come in here, play with Connor, see what happens, right? There's a chance for that to happen. And the Oilers have so many of the big pillars already in place, right? Like if the Oilers had $25 million, but it was like, you know, Dreisaitl needs a new deal and that's going to eat up half. Like that's a different situation, but like they have two high-end centermen. They have a couple of good quality young wingers in Pugliarvi and Yamamoto. I know Yamamoto's coming off a rough year, but still. Even Taking some bottom- heat too, if you notice that. Oh Yeah. Um, but even like Ryan McLeod will be in the bottom six, say what you want about Zach Cassian and Josh Archibald, they'll be back in the bottom six and they're serviceable NHLers. The forward group has these really interesting pillars in place that, you know, you don't need to go out and add a $10 million player right now. That's not what we're talking about. And even go to the blue line, it would be, but go to the blue line where like Darnell nurse, Ethan bear. I know he's, you know, didn't have a great end of the season either, but he's still an important part of the future. Adam Larson will be back. Bouchard's coming up. Like, you have a bunch of really, really solid pieces that what you're looking to add isn't necessarily a superstar. You have the big, the big areas are checked off for this Oilers organization. They just need to go find those really, really good complementary pieces. Now, yes, they need some complementary pieces, but I also think that they, I mean, it's, it's, it's to your point, Tyler, they need another impact player. They need another impact winger. Yeah. They need a guy who, if it's not Connor and it's not Leon and it's not Nuge, and we're going to talk about him in a second, or Pooley Arvey, you know, I'm expecting Yamamoto to bounce back next year a little bit, but they need a guy who, if they throw him out there, there's a good chance he's going to score for the team and not just be able to grind out a shift until Connor and Leon get back on the ice. They, they need to get away from that. And it's improved slightly since Connor, Neon, and uh, Connor, Leon, and Nuge kind of scored 60% of the goals a couple of years ago, but it's still not close to good enough. And it's still not going to get you past a team like the Winnipeg Jets in the playoffs. So, impact winger, please, please, please. All right. Again, Owen Radio Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. I want to know your answers to the giant question What is the Oilers' biggest need going into the offseason? Tell us. We want to hear your answers. Next up, I want to tell you about skipthedishes.ca. It is Friday afternoon. You've worked enough for another week. You made it through without punching a coworker, especially after an Oilers loss. That is a feat in itself. And I suggest you reward yourself. Maybe a pizza. Maybe some Chinese food. Maybe a nice donair, Tyler. Huh? Uh, Sushi? Mm. Skipthedishes.ca has got everything you need. Get yourself fed. Tip your drivers. Enjoy your weekend. Maybe find a new restaurant this weekend that you've never tried before. Skip the digit.ca, make it happen. All right. So there's a couple of things that have come out, obviously, post mortem now that the season's in the books. Real quick before we move on, how's everybody feeling a couple of days up? Over it a little bit more. Like, I don't know, just focused on the off season now. It's time to see if this team can improve. Rick, you're fired up on Tuesday. The, the emotional sting is still is, is, is pretty much gone but it's still not a great season. And then you still there's a billion things to be good about uh, that are, that are positive going forward, but it was still a failure of the season. And I just want to make sure that the, the brass knows that and they have to, you know, we need better. So the I'm emotional part's gone, home. but it's still frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. But there's still like, guys, this isn't, I don't want anybody walking away from this going, Hey, that was a good year for us. That was a bad year. Make it better next year. Let's go. Dan, how are you feeling? I'm still good. I uh, I think that there's a lot of positives we can especially take away from the regular season. 
And uh, yeah, we're into off season mode, start planning for next year. And like we said, there's, there's things that we need to see this off season that we haven't necessarily um, been able to put kind of a, put the, the rakes to the coal. I don't know how to say that, put the, uh, put the coals to the feet, I guess, is kind of the idea that I'm saying where, where I don't it's, know if that's it's, it either. Well, it's the summer, <laughs> it's, it's the summer to, uh, it's the put summer to put some fire. fresh, there we go. Irons in the fire, feet to the grain. Who, cold who, yeah, who cold to the, yeah, feet to the cold. The you got to walk across the... <laughs> Something for Ken Holland. This is Ken Holland's year to put his face on the barbecue grill and fire it up and just mm. see what happens, you know? And and uh, I think fans are expecting that this offseason. I think that that's, that's the big thing that we take away from this is it's like like Rick said, you know, you, you can't be happy with, with a first-round exit anymore. Yeah. This is what they be... told us, though. This is what they told us. This was the summer. This was the summer. This yep. was the and summer. That, and that's the well, way the it's summer been is here. The exactly. summer is here. Let's lay on our loungers and give me something now, guys. Well, yep. let's and... talk about how it started. Ken Holland did his postseason press conference the other day, went over an hour. He said a lot of words, despite not saying a whole lot. Uh, I was transcribing it for the nation on Twitter. And it did, was a disaster. I'm not going to lie to you. Did you know he worked for Detroit? I had heard that. I had heard that. Uh, <laughs> Every time. Jokes, if you missed it. It eventually turned into a Red Wings conference, almost. And it was talking about all the things that happened in the 90s. It was very weird. Basically, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tyler, but I think Ryan Rashog broke Ken Holland there for about 10 minutes. He basically asked, Rashog asked an excellent question. He said, does this add more pressure on you to spend futures to win now? And then all of a sudden it turned into, I used to do this and I did that. And back in 96, I did that. In 2008, I was just, everybody's like, okay, okay. But like, you know, that was a minute ago. Well, he he's like- <laughs> We a, know he, your resume. What are you going to do tomorrow? He's like a scrambling quarterback, right? when you put a little pressure on him, he just kind of starts running around. And Rashad did that for all the people who bitch at the media for being soft or blah, blah, blah. Go listen to those questions Rashad hit Holland with. Cause that's about as hard as a media member has come at an Oilers GM in a while. Like even in the Shirelli years, granted Shirelli barely ever, I mean, he didn't do a lot of that shit, Not but Rashad went at him and like, didn't. And I, I think what irked Rashad almost was that the first question didn't get answered and Holland kind of dodged it. And Rashad went at him a little bit more in his second question, which I thought was really good because, you know, Ken Holland should kind of know that there's pressure on him. If he doesn't recognize it, then it's nice that someone was able to kind of give him a nudge and say, you know, you probably should be telling the fan base about, you know, going all in. And I know Ken Holland wasn't going to sit there and like lay out his plans and he wasn't going to introduce <laughs> Blake Coleman at that press conference. <laughs> but I would have personally liked to hear him say the words Stanley cup contender. Like this is our window. We're moving in to be a Stanley cup contender. We want to, he just kept talking about like, while well, we're trying to build a program, we're trying to build an excellent hockey program. Like he's running the fucking Okanagan hockey school. Like, man, we're trying to win rings here. Like Connor McDavid's under contract for five more years. Let's pick up the pace a little, but I understand why I've he played there. it down the middle of fairway. I've been there. I've done it. I've and that too, it. like Ken, <laughs> you built, you built a Stanley cup contender when there was no cap. Like if he could go and not have a cap and Daryl just opened the checkbook, like life would be fucking easy right now. But <laughs> I just, I didn't get a lot of substance out of it. It was a lot of just like, you know, four or five minute answers that kind of always left you being like, what? I, well, that's what it, I mean. Like it was, it was a lot of words with not a lot of content. Yeah. I don't, I don't listen to those things for, for that reason. I think it, it, I've kind of just as a, as a sports fan, you know, like we talked about it with Shirelli, even with Lowe, like, and McTavish, like it was just all it, all it turns into is like funny jokes for us to have afterwards, you know, visually better. And, and, you know, the, the, we know a thing or two about winning championships. Like those, those are just non substantive statements that they make. And yeah, Holland is just a guy that tends to drag his answers on until you forget what question you asked. And, and, and to your point too, Tyler. And I think that, uh, you know, for, for all the media guys here in Edmonton, they do take a lot of flack and, and Rashog did do a good job of speaking for the fan base and letting, you know, kind of setting the tone for interviews going forward that hopefully Rashog is going to be okay to be that guy that continues yeah. to fucking put the feet to the coal or put the face to the barbecue <laughs> grill, whatever you need to do to, to speak for this fan base. It's that's what you need. And also, shout out to Daniel Nugent Bowman, who may have earned Daniel himself Nugent a Hopkins. contract. Yeah. We are all Daniel just... Nugent Hopkins. 
<laughs> I loved just, it. Uh... To be honest, I got to tell you, like as it went on, so it started off funny because Gregor actually called Ken Holland Dave Tippett to start. Yeah. And it was a mistake. But then Jim Matheson called him Dave Tippett. And then from there, Daniel Nugent Bowman from The Athletic asked a question about making an offseason trade or something like that. But then after, it was Daniel Nugent Hopkins over and over and over again. By my count, it was five or six times. Yeah. And by the fourth or fifth, sixth time, I was howling laughing because it was just... Why does he keep coming back? Like, I get it though. Like Nugent Hopkins is one of his employees currently. He's been around a long time, probably one of the biggest items on his to-do list. It was just funny. The whole thing was funny. So what I learned, we were all Dan- Daniel Nugent Hopkins. And shout I, out to him too, by the way, for having <laughs> a sense of humor about it. Can you imagine another- if they had a deal done earlier in the year, but it was considered null and void because he wrote the wrong first name on it? Like they penned up and it was all agreed to and then it fell apart. That's why Nugent Hopkins is, his extension isn't signed because he actually tried to sign Daniel Nugent Bowman. Yeah, he's and that's, completely gaffed on it. And that's why these press conferences are so goofy to me because it is just like the stuff that comes out of it. The takeaways we have from it is Ken Holland what used to be a GM of the Detroit Red Wings and he signed a media member I didn't know possibly that. to a contract. Right, like I, I just it, there's no insight given whatsoever. And you're right, Tyler too. Don't expect him to. Don't expect him to tip his hand to the to the entire league. Like this is exactly who we're targeting, and you should offer them contracts or anything like that. I but, think yeah, it's yeah. For me, the thing that bothers me about the press conference is Dan is 100 percent right. You don't go into watching one of those expecting to get answers. You know, you don't go into it expecting him to be like, I want to sign this guy and that guy. Can't talk about it right now because he's currently playing for blah blah blah. You, that's not gonna happen. Yeah. But in this city, I think going with the I know a thing or two about winning strategy isn't what we need it doesn't play well with a really educated fan base and that's what the oilers have like it it just really doesn't you need to give something of more substance the other funny part and i'm trying to remember who asked the question but they asked him something along the lines of like hey do you think you could do this this or this and his response was like did i say that and they were like no i'm asking you like (laughs) could you do it he was like oh oh Oh, sorry. Uh, well, what? if we're looking at some stuff, that we, if we look at some stuff that we did learn, what we did learn definitively is Mike Smith's coming back, right? He said he's going to meet up with him in Kelowna or talk to his agent, but he wants to sign Mike Smith. So that's, that's good come negotiating. Back. That's good negotiating. Well, <laughs> Yes. you're coming back i'm coming to you you just sit there and wait you mark me down the number on a I, piece of paper that you want i was joking on the nielsen show that like ken holland comes into mike smith's house and like his kids run over and they're like uncle kenny and he like gives them a hug <laughs> and then they sit down and have dinner and then at the end of the night it's kind of just like well two mil again <laughs> two mil again we're good and that's the negotiation he's coming back for two mil i pencil it in it's done Another thing we learned from that press conference, and I think one of the positives that most people took away was when Ken Holland, he said it a few times actually, that over the next week, he's going to let kind of emotions subside a little bit. And then he wants to consult with his leadership group about their thoughts on the team and what they think he should do. So in that group, he kept mentoring, again, it was like, he said it a bunch of times. So names came and went depending on the answer, but it was Connor, it was Leon, it was Darnell Nurse, It was Nuge, and at times Adam Larson was thrown in there as well. So there's a group of five in there that it seems like he wants to know what they're going to do. Um, I just wanted to get everybody's thoughts on, personally, I think that's the way to go. That's the way to do business. You want to talk to your team's core. You want to get their thoughts. I'm not saying Connor says, do this, and you just do it. That's not what I'm saying, but you have to consult your best players. Anything less than that, I think, would be a failure. Did anybody else kind of get that same sense? I, yeah, always, I, I, I like the idea. You got to give your you got to give your superstars a voice and feel like they're a part of it. But you're right. the 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 line for me gets drawn when when those four are making roster decisions. That's not their job, and they and like they should be able to have input as to you know who is the core and who do they want on this team. But outside of that, I don't know if I want to hear you know. Connor McDavid has identified this guy as his winger for the off season. Why not? We should go. Get I him. would. I don't know. I just, I don't know. It, it I would absolutely like, want Connor's opinion on that. Yeah. When I think about, you know, like you guys talked about it on our, on our bonus episode there about how, you know, the, 
the demand was made for Nuge to be on Connor's line. And I don't know if that necessarily was to our detriment because the, didn't the he give two names? Wasn't he? Lo- well, he was looking oh. for some help. He yeah, was looking I, for some help and said, the only two guys in this team that could help me right now is one of these two. So I want one of these two. It wasn't necessarily just new to die. It was one of these two. Cause those are the only ones. Those are the best options. Yeah. And I think going to Connor McDavid and saying like, Hey, you know, we're kind of interested in like these three or four guys. Like, do you know, yeah, that's do different you like too, them? Right? What, what kind of, yeah. What kind of player do you want? You want, yeah. that's different too. Yeah, for back? sure. Do you want your Pat line? A? You know, I also, what kind of player do you want? I also think it can be used to the Oilers advantage in the extent that like, Let's say you're talking with Jaden Schwartz's camp and you just give Connor a heads up like, hey, we're negotiating with this guy. Give him a ring. See what's up like that. That Connor's at that level now in the sport where if you're an unrestricted free agent, you're sitting there debating where to go. And Connor calls you and is like, hey, man, we have a great room. Like we have a great time. You're going to get to play with me. I would love a chance to have you on my line. Like he Mm -hmm. he should be a part of the recruiting process. Yeah. Yeah, That's it's, fair. I think it's a. T- I think it's it's really got to be a team uh, team thing now. Everybody is agreed. Everyone's going in the same direction, and you know the, the kind of the coach or the GM kind of have to direct uh, direct the ship a bit. But we need everybody pushing the same way. So I think having them all in there at the one time it keeps everyone on the same page. You know that uh, that culture you get in the dressing room all of a sudden improves because they're all on the same page. We're all here to do the same thing, and yeah, in the long run, you get a guy like Connor calling you up. It's a. Uh, well, that's a pretty good uh, deal, uh, seal deal sealer to, uh, you know, ink, ink your name on the UFA contract. I would I also s- look at it as a sense too. Like if you're in the dressing room, you've got a different view vantage point on the team than somebody in management. Yeah. It's the same in any business anywhere, you know, um, those guys that are in the room know more about what's going on in the room than the coach or the GM. So I think it would be a failure to not have the leadership group involved. Again, I'm not saying, I'm not saying at all that they should just be like, Connor wants this. I'm going to do that. But you should create an environment where your leadership group is able to give you honest feedback and say something like, listen, we need to improve this area, this area. We need a player like this. Maybe there's an exact na- a specific name in there. I-, I would love if you chased X or Y or Z, something like that. I, I just think that's good business. Yeah, and I guess when you look back on it too, right? The, the trades that have happened previous in the previous regime, the you know the documented relationship between Kajula and the the core. Um, there was another one too that got shipped out. Strom was tight with them. Strom was in there, yeah. So so yeah, I guess in that sense it is. It's just different, I guess, because when you think back to the like, I don't know, I don't know if I ever remember hearing any kind of conversations like this about Malkin and Crosby or. Um, well, for sure they would have had. I would for sure they would have sat down with coach. Yeah. I guarantee it. Everybody yeah. does this. It's a lead, everybody has a leadership group. Like yeah. NFL's got your captains. They'd have that little captains meeting. Um, coach will definitely have a little group, and you know that, that's five guys is is, is nice. Um, it's like you think Tom Brady he mentioned, didn't say he mentioned Nuge, back. man. Yeah. Um, he did mention Nuge. He so. mentioned Nuge. He mentioned a dude not on contract. That's him and Drysaddle have brought Nuge up like a handful of times throughout the year. Like, I think it's pretty clear that they would want him back. And I think that ultimately leads to the deal getting done. Like if you're Ken Holland and you sit in your exit meetings and dry side, but, Holland said Holland yeah, Holland Holland too. Right? but, but like if, That's if you, that was the thing I got me, if you're Holland and you sit in those exit meetings and you hear McDavid dry settle and nurse all say like, we want him back. We value him. Like we, we can win with him. I don't think you can possibly justify letting Nuge go over like $200,000, right? Like that's just silly. The other thing I wanted to bring up from the press conference, bag milk, you just touched on it. Did you catch when Ken Holland got his brain wrapped into explaining where everyone is in the arena? He was like, listen, I'm, I'm a manager. I'm up at the top. I'm looking at the team from the top down and there's players on the ice and the fans are in the stands and the coaches are a little bit closer to the ice. And then he stopped himself. And I was like, <laughs> Why? Why it was, it, was a, it, it was an adventure, man. That's the only thing I could say about it. Speaking of um, adventure, if you want to go on one, make sure that you have all the insurance products that you need to do so. Our friends at Cornerstone Insurance have everything you need, be it personal, vehicle, house, any type of insurance product or after. Go to cornerstoneins.ca. On the left-hand side of the screen, you will see a tab that says Citizens of the Nation. There's a special little deal in there for you. What? If you need, if you need insurance... I'm recommending Cornerstone. (laughs) Head on over to cornerstoneins.ca. All right. Let's move on a little bit. 
Uh, the insiders are now going to be getting to the busy season again, as we lead up to the draft and free agency. That's when you're going to want to follow guys like Frank Saravalli, the Elliot Friedman's, the Bob McKenzie's, Darren Dreger's, blah, blah, blah. Now, Elliot Friedman this morning jumped on the radio in Calgary and he had some notes about the Oilers. Tyler, what insight you got on that? So the Coles notes version of it is that when it comes to Nugent Hopkins, he said a deal might've been close at the beginning of the year. And now it maybe might not be as close, which is interesting. Uh, the Adam Larson deal, he brought this up on Tim and Sid or just t- Tim and friends, I should say as well. And he said the Larson deal is going to get done. Like, I think we can kind of write that one in pen going to be three, four years for around the same AAV, probably $4 million. So it sounds like Larson is coming back. Friedman made it sound like a Koskinen buyout may be more likely than a Neil buyout, which is interesting at first, but the more I thought about it, the more it actually made sense. And that was kind of the, the gist of the Elliot Friedman rumblings. Well, let's start it off with Ryan Nugent Hopkins. Since he was first up, uh, I saw the quotes going around on Twitter. Um, extension was close early prior to the season, then things fall apart. May not look good. Now, that doesn't really mean anything to me. Uh, there's a lot of noise all the time when people negotiate new contracts. So will he, won't he? Obviously, we're going to find out here in short order. Free agency is only, what, a month away? month and a half away? I have no idea. Something like that. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about Nuge. We already talked about Holland in the press conference. He's included him in his leadership group in the core. Every single time he talked about the core, he talked about Ryan Nugent Hopkins. Tyler brought it up. Anytime asked about it, Drysaddle and McDavid would pump his tires. Seems like he's a guy they want. What do you think? Is this just noise as, as negotiations happen? Maybe a little public posturing through the insiders to try and push the number in either direction, be it term or dollars. What's your take, everybody? Ryan Nugent I'm. I think it's just noise. I think it's just noise. I do believe that um, within Rogers, I think this contract will get done. Uh, it may have been closer before and a little bit further apart right now, but I think at the end of the day, both parties want the exact same thing. And I really don't see his, his side asking for some astronomical number that, uh, that we're not going to be willing to bargain down a bit or even willing to pay in general. So I think it gets done. I'm just, I'm not even, uh, I'm not listening to any of that noise. Dan. I am kind of of the opinion that if he true, if they truly felt he was a part of the core and I, and I do agree with you, I think they do. Um, I don't know why they're playing these games right now. I, I just, I don't know. I don't know why there's been, this has been dragged what out. Games as long as though. Yeah. Because you're not gonna. This stuff doesn't. This stuff doesn't usually get done in the season, right? And we're not used to that. But if you watch other teams out there, this stuff gets done at the end of the year. That's why I think. I think fans get a little. Landis dog doesn't have a deal in Colorado. Yeah, I think we get a little bit nervous because we do have every right to have all sorts of terrible PTSD. We've been hurt before. In every different way, we've lost superstars. We lost people. We've you know players that we really just love. We've lost games. We've lost everything. So I get it, and I. But I think this is part of the being in the position we're in nowadays that, you know, sometimes there is going to be some back and forth and that's not a bad thing. And at the end of the day, they sign the dotted line and we get back to where we're supposed to be. And bag of milk goes by is about the seven new jerseys. He has to buy now. Hey, Rick, I love this positivity yeah. from you, buddy. This is good. It's the same this way all the time stuff. though. But, but I I, that's what I, I, I feel like the fans just get a little, get a little upset and you're a little, cause I, I do agree. And I, I, we've been there. We've been hurt. Man. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a black hole right here where my heart used to be. Um, it's, that's just the way it is to be an Oilers fan, but this is, this is a new game for us. We need to have a little confidence in, in that, in that organization. And we we have a really good team right now, a couple of, a couple extra pieces and who knows what happens next year. I'm just sitting at the point right now where I feel like in my heart of hearts, that was the last game we saw Ryan Nugent Hopkins in an Oilers jersey for now. I, I don't know if that's a, a forever proposition just because of this team. Oh, there's no way there's a uh, leaves and coming back like a Ryan Smith. Zero percent. I, 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 well, we I mean, I wouldn't time. say that necessarily. I hope for but... it all the time. I still hope for Taylor to come back, but I just, I don't think that happens as often. So if he does go, it's, but I just don't think he does. Tyler. <laughs> uh, I get the like gut feel thing, Dan, because I have a bit of that too. And I was kind of, I, I see what you're saying in the sense of like, if they really wanted to get it done, why didn't they get it done early in the year? But 
I, I think at the beginning of the year, they were just a little bit separated and they kind of said, you know, we'll just kick it down the road a little bit, kick it down the road a little bit. And it got messed up because he, he wasn't playing good. And the Oilers might have been less willing to go back to a number that they maybe would have been at early in the year. And there might have been a point where Nugent Hopkins camp was in there going, fuck, should have taken the number at the beginning of the year. That might be the best we were going to get, right? Like this conversation at the beginning of the year was six and a half, six point seven five. Where could he be around there? And now it's shifted to the mid fives. I think that kind of tells you where this negotiation may have gone. If Ryan Nugent Hopkins wants to chase the bag and sign for seven by six and a half with the Seattle Kraken, all the power to him, man. But you can't sit there and say you want to win and you want to be a part of an exciting, like if you want to win, be a part of an exciting core and be somewhere where the fans love you. You stay put. You've made a lot of money. And I know it's easy for us on the outside to sit there and be like, oh, well, you know, it's only $7 million over six years or $6 million over six years. Like, why would you walk away from a good situation for that? But I get it. It's still a lot of money and all that. I think it gets done. I think ultimately Nuge will go to market and I, I'm not sure how many big name contenders are going to have the money to spend on, on a guy like Nugent Hopkins, who isn't necessarily a driver, but a damn good top six complimentary player. And I think eventually they'll circle back to Edmonton and they'll find a way to get the deal done. I think that it's exactly what Tyler said. There's going to be teams out there that could pay him more money. Now, do you want to Anson Carter yourself? If you don't remember, Anson Carter found himself a spot along the, alongside the Sedins of Vancouver and ripped it up. He then chased the bag in Columbus, and then eventually just that was it. From there, he was just never the same guy that just had the perfect fit alongside Daniel and Hendrick. And if you're Ryan Nugent Hopkins, buddy, I love you. You know I do. You got to think it through. There is no other team in the NHL where you could play beside Connor or Leon. There's not. Both of those guys want you back. Both of those guys want to play with you. It's your call, man. Do you actually want to win or do you want to chase the bag? We're going to find out here real quick. It's not going to be very long before we find out where his mind was at. Because if Ryan Nugent Hopkins Does... leaves to sign with the Seattle Kraken for seven and a half, he's like, well, he doesn't care about winning. He just wants, he wants to play ponies in the offseason. Does he go to UFA season? Does he, is he signed before he's a free man? I right. say, yes, he signs before. I think when like, is free agency, Tyler, Twenty eighth, July 28th. I think I, I, I bet you it comes right down to the wire and he signs like a day or two before. <laughs> That's good for the old uh, heart. The old ticker is going to be pumping like, he, cause here's another thing too. Yes. The pressure. I mean, Ryan Nugent Hopkins old holds all of the cards here all of them. And there's pressure on the Edmonton Oilers to get a deal done. One that makes sense. Mind you, I'm not saying, listen, president and CEO of the Nugent Hopkins fan club, been here sitting member since 2011. However, you can't, you can't overspend by a crazy amount on the guy. I get all that. I'm with everybody that says it. However, look at the roster. Instead of having to find one top six left winger, all of a sudden, Ryan Nugent Hopkins leaves, and you have to find two. Look and at the free agency list this year, and I beg you to see where are two left wingers better than Ryan Nugent Hopkins that you will be able to get for the same money or cheaper. You'll have to start Center. making trades. Or you're gonna you have to make trades for that, and in which case you're gonna uh, lose some depth in other positions. So yeah, I agree. That the, at the end of the day, it just does not seem smart a uh, very smart choice for the ways not to have him sign and obviously also, I, to the proper contract but it, i do think it, it's also interesting too like how many people i don't know what it is about edmonton and maybe it's like this in other cities i just don't know but like when a guy needs a new contract in this city man we're fucking tough on these guys as if you <laughs> wouldn't also ask for a raise if you need a new uh, need a new contract in your specific job i don't know it's weird I think it's a grass is always greener thing, right? Like the certain fans, and again, I hate lumping together Oilers fans, even though I, all I, I do it all the time. I don't need to. Um, but <laughs> you'll sit there and you watch Nugent Hopkins all game, every game. You see every mistake. And if you let those mistakes snowball in your mind, you'll convince yourself Ryan Nugent Hopkins is not a good top six winger. Confirmation it, bias. It is. And then you'll sit there and go, well, Jaden Schwartz, I remember him from Team Canada. He's pretty good. He scores whatever, 15, 20 goals a season. <laughs> I like Jaden Schwartz. 
Okay, well, you don't watch Jaden Schwartz 56 to 82 times a year. You don't know Jaden Schwartz's bad tendencies. You remember him rolling through Rogers' place a few times a year, and you watch him and go, ah, Schwartz, I like that guy. And, you know, it's the grass is always greener, right? It's, and and that, that, I'll end it there. I think that's all it is. Like, you have, you know, every little detail about Ryan Nugent Hopkins' game, and you can sit there and go, Thomas Tatar will be better. Will he? Because Thomas Tatar almost has gotten healthy scratched in the playoffs in his last two cities. So when he also had fewer points and goals than Ryan Nugent Hopkins on a year when everybody said Ryan Nugent Hopkins was bad. His defensive metrics are good. Nuge is fine defensively too. And Nuge kills penalties and Nuge helps on the power play. And here's the other thing. If you're going to go into a summer where you want to make all these big changes and they need two or if you count Nuge, two or three wingers into this team, if you bring in two or three brand new wingers, there is no guarantee they fit. You know Nuge fits. You know Nuge works here. Why would you go spend and bring in three fresh faces when take the risk with two and bring back the safety net? Nuge is your safety net in this situation. If you have to pay an extra 200K, fucking pay the extra 200K because you know he works. Well, one thing that's interesting to me is just the blinders on this, right? Like everybody talked about Nuge and Hopkins five on five scoring. It was bad this year. It just... Yeah. That's there's no other way to put it at five on five. This was one of the worst seasons of Ryan Nugent Hopkins career since he was a rookie. Now what's more likely that he has completely forgotten how to play hockey at even strength or that he's going to bounce back next year, probably get himself back to where he normally is at, which is more likely. He's going to bounce back. He's exactly. bouncing back. And, exactly. Again, People are like, oh, go get Alex Wenberg. Are you fucking kidding me? The guy that got bought out by Columbus? You want to go sign Alex Wenberg? That's your solution to replacing Ryan Nugent Hopkins? Like, come on, people. Uh, It doesn't make sense. I will say in my defense, I don't want him gone. I just have a feeling in my gut that 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 is the last time we see him. Yeah, see, I think it's just too much work that you have to do. That creates so many extra I agree completely. I think, like, and, like, we can't discount the fact that he's also a centerman and I, and you know, he's not, I know he's not a, he's not a, you know, a superstar centerman. But what, like, if one of those two go and, down, if one exactly, of those two get hurt, that's exactly he flips it. over real yeah. nice. Cause you not look at another. like, I think that that's where, that's where you guys has thought of, you know, those last few days before free agency hits is really a, a true indicator because the Oilers can also co- have conversations with free agents at that time too. Right. Did and they, they get rid of fall- that. They got rid of that. Oh, did they? Well, yeah. then never mind. I mean, I was thinking, I was thinking of that I mean, too when I said, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. They, on, I, they, that they got rid of it now. as a rule, but it's still, yeah, it's not going to happen. Nelly. You're going to call <laughs> so, them. Up, like, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Holland. It's against yeah. the rules. I cannot talk to you. Sorry. So um, hypothetically yeah. speaking, if the Seattle Kraken <laughs> were to offer you this contract, yeah. Like it, those it's 10 a.m. Signings, happens. those 10 a.m. Signings are done yeah. right. Like that. We get through all this right now. Ready? Let's go. Yeah, and so you look at the you look at that free agent list at, in around the ages of of Nugent Hopkins, and that's the other thing too, right? It can't be discredited is that he's he's in the age of the core of this team, and other than him and Brandon Saad and Gabriel Landeskog, who is not going to be a free agent, and Jaden Schwartz, it's it's pretty small. It's a pretty small list there. I don't assume Taylor Hall is in the free agency wire anymore either. Can so. we call somebody in Colorado? Can we ask them if the people there are getting all upset that Landis, are they all worried that Landis Cosby is leaving? Well, I don't think, I think the fact that they're having us? success in the playoffs is helping. <laughs> well, cause you have Dude, to look at the we list were here. Winning, so we've got, if we were winning right now, we'd still be concerned about whether or not Nuge is lo- leaving or not. Yes. Uh, so looking at the list here real quick, Dan is, I'm just, this is based on points produced in 2000, in 2021. Okay. Gabriel Landis Cog is the top UFA I would be shocked if he is not back in Colorado. He's their captain. He is kind of their guy. He's a big spokesman for the team. But they haven't won a cup yet. Okay, well, he's a bust then. So <laughs> get rid of him. So Landis Gog, I cannot imagine that it happens. No. Uh, David Krejci, 35-year-old center. <laughs> no thanks. Okay, non-comparable. Ovi, no way he's leaving Washington. <laughs> It's just not going to happen. And then next up in terms of unrestricted free agents is Ryan Nugent Hopkins and Mike Hoffman. And Nugent plays so much more, uh, so uh, plays such a bigger uh, role on his team than, than Mike Hoffman. Well, and you want and to talk about And then next up it. after that, uh, it would be Taylor Hall, but I agree with Dan again. I just, I think Boston will resign him. You talk about yeah. a guy like 
Mike Hoffman, and that's exactly what we were talking about when it comes to have you seen what Mike Hoffman does with his other teams? Like he's he's a, he's a problem. He's the Taylor Hall off the ice that nobody actually talks about being the Taylor Hall <laughs> off the ice. Like it's a, it is a yeah I don't know it's Next, it's go uh, with you go with what you know versus the question marks that you don't. And just looking uh, keeping it going down the list here a little bit. Zach Hyman, he'd be a nice fit. I like I like Zach Hyman. I think and, there's but, something like, to can, all that chatter, by the way. You could probably get both done, though, no? But yeah, an, an addition, him in addition would be nice. Him in, like, uh, as opposed to, then no. Can I share my math now? One Just more please. sec, Tyler. I'm okay, almost okay. done here. Oh. Uh, Blake Coleman <laughs> would on the list. Again, he'd be a nice fit. Uh, Jason Spezza, 1,000 years old. I mean, I would like a guy with some experience. I don't know if I want more than one 40 year old on the, on the team though, quite frankly, but that's the guy you pick up at the deadline though. You yes. don't want him for the most of the season. You know, like bring, come here for the deadline. Let's go. And then the people, uh, Tyler mentioned Thomas Tatar. He is just so you know, he's turning 31, everybody, uh, 10 goals, 20 <laughs> assists. So he had an even worse year than Nugent Hopkins. For those of you that are saying that Nuge had a bad year, Alex Wenberg, he had fewer points. Uh, Paul Statsny, He's 35. Who knows what happens with him? And then that's kind of, does Michael Granlin interest anybody? Not me specifically. <laughs> Can we put some of this stuff on billboards, please? And just post it up throughout town. It's pretty just amazing so though. Can, like, right. See it with their own eyeballs. There's so many definitive statements on, well, just spend the money on someone else. Who, who, who? And then also not, that not player that. needs to want to sign with you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and then for a city like Edmonton to, uh, again, it's just, me turning into a pro Nugent Hopkins podcast, but like for a city like Edmonton, where we have so much trouble drawing in free agents, quality free agents without having to break the bank. Why are we so opposed to one of the best available free agents? We just walked through the list. Why are we so opposed to one of the best available free agents signing here just because he had a bad year? And every year we'll talk about, you've got to keep your draft picks. You've got to grow your draft picks, grow your draft picks. And so all of a sudden we're going to grow this draft pick and give, and give up on them after one year, one bad year. All right, Tyler, math, yep. please. All right. So if you're listening to this and you're going, okay, the Oilers, yes, I keep hearing about how much money they have and how much money do they really have and all that stuff. I pulled up Puckpedia. I did the math. I'm assuming, and again, I'm using the outer marker for some of these returning free agents. Let's say Ryan Nugent Hopkins gets $6 million. That's a little high, but let's say the Oilers just say, nope, we're doing what it takes to get him. It's six mil. Okay. New just signed for six mil. Kyler Yamamoto, no arbitration rights. One year deal. Two million bucks is probably fair for Yamamoto. I filled out the depth with Jujar Kara for 1.1. And then I signed Haas and Shore for 900 K each to be my extra players. Even if they don't sign those guys, you're getting guys making that much money. So yep. Jujar has to be quali- Jujar has to be qualified. He'll be 1.3. Don't qualify him, sign him for less. I don't think Jujar gets 1.3 on the open market. So fair enough. Fair enough. Even if, but if it's 1.3 K, yeah, 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 I filled out the bottom part of the depth, fourth line center, extra forwards with, basically replacement level guys on the blue line brought back cuckoo to be the seventh defenseman at 900 K assumed Larson's getting four mil. And I assumed Mike Smith is getting $2 million. So that leads you with, I also took clef bomb off LTIR just for the purpose of this, of having the 4.1 million on the roster. Um, but with that scenario there that I just laid out, you have two or three, six, eight, you have 11 forward signed seven <laughs> defensemen and one goalie. <laughs> With 11 forwards, seven defensemen, one goalie signed, you have $15.577 million to spend. All you need to do is sign two forwards with that money and a goalie. That gives you an illustration of, they can average basically $5 million per acquisition. And if Clef Bomb's not ready, you can LTIR him and replace him with a $4 million defenseman in free agency, and that works out fine too. Uh First of all, I'm going to ask somebody listening to this right now. We're going to need somebody to double check Tyler's math on this. Your M check <laughs> math is a thing that we all deal with here at yeah. the nation network. So we're going to operate under the assumption that Tyler is correct. So what you're telling me, Tyler, is that that Nuge signs for six yep. Larson at the deal that he's projected at. Yep. Bop, 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 the Oilers still have $15 million. Oh, I bought out Neil and Koskinen. I'm assuming they're going to get bought out. 
Do you think so? I Do you think, think that, both guys get bought out though? Cause that's just a ton of dead space. So they're either getting at, bought out or retained and traded. So it's not a big difference. If you want to undo those buyouts and, and see what the money would be. Can I do that? Yeah, maybe do that and check that out. So going into 20, uh, 2021, 22, sexy reg still on the books for 1.5 for another two years. Uh, Pouliot finally comes off. Hey, man, I can't believe the others were still paying for Benoit Pouliot this year. That is bananas. And then there's also two years of paying Lucic to be a Calgary fame. That is 750 K. So, so even if the Oilers didn't buy out either of them, they would then have, they'd have one more forward. So then we're looking at 12, 12 forwards under contract and seven defensemen and two goalies. So your roster is full at that point and you have $8.75 million to spend still. So there's a lot of, there's, there's, this is a huge off season. Yeah. Like you can That's... get two quality forwards, even if you don't buy out one of either of Neil or Koskinen, you can get two quality forwards at that price. That is, that's a lot of money. That's... So Tyler, you did make an interesting point earlier before we started recording, talking about Daryl's uh, going to need a new contract. And if he plays the way he did this year in 2021, 22, he's going to get some smoke. Okay. Hold on though. But with that contract, it's only going to be like, he, can he get, can you pay him more than Leon? I bet you, I bet you nurse comes in at like s- between seven, seven and a half million, right? Like a little, so like that's head- only, that's, that's, That's only, only an extra mil- two million then. Yeah, yeah. And and Russell everyone comes off the freaking books, out. so that yeah, almost keeps freaking out. out. They're like, oh, he's going to cost eight million. Like, we need to find eight million dollars. No, we need to find the the raise he's going to get. And if yeah. it's two million, you can find two million. That's no problem. Yeah. So, this is a huge off season. You know, for a lot of time as Oilers fans, we've been kind of sold this off season as. No, just in year three of Holland in off season two or whatever the fuck our math is at these days. There's a lot of cap space to get some stuff done. They have room. And like we mentioned a little bit earlier, if you're looking for a reason to be hopeful here, Oilers fans, the Oilers have cap space, whereas there are plenty of teams, again, looking at puckpedia.com that do not, that do not going into next year, right? So there could be some deals to be had where, a prospect like, I don't know, I'm just throwing out some names just because like a Samorakov plus could maybe get you something, you know, whereas maybe something more substantive too than it would have been maybe a year ago, two years ago. So this could be a really interesting year for Ken Holland. He has got to get this right. He cannot spend that money wastefully. We can't have an Andrew Ladd free agent contract come in here. Oof. That's yeah. a dangerous game you kind of play with unrestricted free agency. Yep. That's again why really, Nugent really Hopkins is. is appetizing because you know he at least works. And even when he's bad, you know what it's like. Like this is his worst year and he still was serviceable. So um, before we get to a hot and cold performance to wrap up the podcast, obviously we need to talk about um, a couple of different things. One, I just want to say the Ethan Bear stuff that came out after the playoffs. Um, uh, first of all, I'm going to give Ethan all the credit in the world for releasing a statement himself, standing up in front of the camera and standing up to what was said about him, the racist bullshit that he was dealing with on social media. No matter what, it doesn't make sense. It's dumb and it's stupid and it's needless. Say what you want about a player's performance or mistakes. You know, we, on this podcast, we were talking about Ethan Bear's giveaway that led to the time goal and blah, blah, blah. But like, come on, be better. This is garbage. This is 2021 and this is garbage. Boys, I'm just around the horn real quick. I loved Ethan Bear standing up and in front of the camera and saying he was going to stand in the face of all the bullshit that was said to him. I loved it. He is a leader in the community here in Edmonton, volunteers his time. He's a leader in his own community. I would take this kid on my team any day of the week. Hands down. Yeah, there's, you said it well. There's, there's no place in our game or any game or anything where somebody's background matters at all. The stuff that, that it's come out since then and has been said is unnecessary. Uh, you know, I've taken some time to really think about this and, and tried to try to kind of pivot it into a situation where I've been taking a course at the U of A now to try and learn about more indigenous affairs and, and first nations, uh, background and trying to learn and understand 
uh, you know, the, the struggles and the issues that they've gone through. I think that if everybody kind of takes the mentality of listening and learning more and talking less, I think we'd be a lot better off. Uh, uh, if yeah, yeah, yesterday on uh, the real life podcast, we had Dusty Legrand on and he owns uh, he owns a, an indigenous uh, clothing company called Mobilize, which is really good stuff. If you head to the real life Instagram, you can find links to it and all that. I um, mean, he just gave us some in- incredible insight into it and sort of talked a little bit about bears response and a lot of really, really good stuff. He has a shirt out right now that just in Oilers colors says fuck racism. And we talked a little bit about that, just about Ethan bear as a person as well. Um, there was, there was a lot of really, really good stuff with dusty Legrand and important educational stuff as well. So go listen to the real life podcast from, from Thursday. And I think he can dusty's words mean a lot more than whatever I'm going to sit here and say right now. So that's what I'll, that's what I'll say. Go check that out. Download the real life podcast, wherever you get podcasts from more importantly, let's all, let's all like Dan said, work together to be better. There's no need for it. There's no need for it at all. Um, all of us here support you, Ethan bear. Love you. Can't wait to see where you go next year and beyond hell of a hockey player, hell of a hockey player. Tyler, let's wrap it up. It's time for the hot and cold performance of the week. Hmm. Go check out our friends at deucevodka.com. You'll see right when you get to the landing page, a handsome picture of Brett Kissel. You've got everything you need to know about Deuce on the website, including a store locator about where you can find it. If you go to deucevodka.com forward slash find us, there's the store locator. Anywhere you want to find it here in Alberta. If you're in Saskatchewan, reach out to sales at deucevodka.com. They will be able to help you out and make it happen as we do every single week to finish off this podcast we eat our veggies we start off with our cold performance of the week nation dan you're up first on my screen your deuce vodka cold form of the week uh well we talked about it a little bit when we were doing our breakdown of our own series but just uh the other day when i finally was able to turn playoff hockey back on uh watched another head scratcher i guess is the way you can put it uh, in the carolina nashville series on goalie interference where the only what interference happened? that occurred, I missed it. It was a it was a, a goal to tie the game late. I'm just trying to bring up the video here, but but a guy uh, or Carolina Hurricane player skates in front to do the screen thing. Does is in the white paint, not touching anything. Predators player comes in, gets his leg around or gets the uh, goalie Saros's leg in between his legs and pins him there. So the only goaltender interference was his own player. They went and reviewed it and they called it goalie interference. It's another one of the situation, you know, just kind of added to the pile of, of what are we even doing here? It's starting to feel like we need to have a symposium on officiating and try and set some baselines that we can go into next season with. But uh, for me, it's just continues to be the NHL and it's officiating inconsistencies uh, are my deuce vodka cold performer of the week. Rick, you're next up. Deuce Vodka, cold from the week. You know what? I think it's uh, it's 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 still time to to put it on them. So I'm going to give it to the team one more time. Um, just couldn't get it done in the playoffs again. I, there's nothing you can really say about it. I just uh, I don't want to take it any further than uh, than this week. And you know, going on from here, everything's uh, looking up, and we're in the off season. It is what it is, but. At, the end of the day, man, like we can't do this again. So, unfortunately, the whole the whole team is going to get the cold performer this one. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Tyler, you're next up. Deuce Vodka cold form of the week. At the uh, towards the end of our podcast on Tuesday, we talked about the news that Wayne Gretzky was leaving the Oilers, and I found this interesting because a lot of Oilers fans, or most of them, didn't really care. Everyone kind of <laughs> knew that he was just holding like a... It was a figurehead. Yeah, it was an honorable position. He showed up to public events. He was around the rink. Like, it was cool. They showed his office off to people who were visiting the OEG building. They brought him in to close sales calls. Like, he didn't actually have like a quote-unquote job with the team. He was just kind of there. And then people outside of Edmonton took this as a chance to be like, Oh, there we go. The last straw for the great one. He's breaking up with the (laughs) Oilers. Like this is what you get McDavid next. And the people who just didn't really understand what was going on, but still decided to 
uh, uh, run their mouths. I, you're my cold performer of the week. You're clueless and stupid. Why are you the way that you are? I hate so much about the things that you choose to be. Just to wrap that up, it was a, uh... It made me laugh, to be honest, yeah. because if you looked through Oilers Twitter, there was so many, oh yeah, I forgot Wayne worked for the team. Oh yeah, I forgot Wayne did this. Oh yeah, what does vice chair mean? Like it was all that kind of stuff. So <laughs> who cares? Like they're not hiring a replacement for that job. That was made for no. just Wayne. And now that he's gone, it's like less money on the payroll. Yeah, unless, unless Mark Messier wants a gig being a vice chair where he just comes and hangs out, then... You know, yeah, who's, who's going to use the office? Are we going to leave it? Like, is, is so. this when your like, kid moves out of the house? Do you change your bedroom? Do you leave it the same way? Put it it's on just like, into a games room? Not it's just got so much dust on the desk because he's never been in there. Just leave it that way. I don't know. I thought it was, it, I was, I'm with Tyler. I thought it was weird. It was like so trying to make a big deal out of. Well, I think we said it. We talked about it on on either on state of the nation or that podcast, just saying that it's like, it's a good distraction from the people that we're going to say, Connor McDavid is going to leave the city. Like, it's just, it it's was that wasn't it. You, just... you said it though, bag milk. If, if the shoe was on the other foot and Lanny McDonald left the flames organization right after they played their last game against the Canucks, you don't think we would have made a few jokes about how he's done. So just Did have, it have fun to with be it. the day after. Did it have to be the day? No, after? But, but well, except that, except that it, that was where that's when Wayne is able to step away from the, organization and not okay but wait a, wait a day or two because we know it's just going <laughs> to stir shit up i honestly it's not like tnt has done anything with him yet it's not like he's gone to work already the like thing he literally that... could have waited till like i don't think tnt could do anything till the next season starts quote unquote right so that's after the cup sometime you literally well, they're gonna start summertime they'll start leeching in some of the coverage as as you've seen with espn and Stephen a smith sure then then sell them like the, they, they do in wrestling where you, like, you don't disclose who's coming but someone's coming but who is, I don't know. You get all this talk, you get all this, you know, you get all this momentum. People are watching in and bang, the big reveal. And there's Wayner. So we need some new marketing guys at TNT, I think. Yeah. Well, it, send it my resume, it, my, my little spiel there. It makes a ton of sense for TNT's perspective too. And it was funny to me that nobody looked at it that way. Like no matter who you are, chances are, if you have any experience with sports or if you heard, have heard one name, from hockey ever in your life chances are it's wayne gretzky and they just have they're trying to grow that game down in the states so who do you get the guy that every single person knows his name well and it, it's a credit to wayne gretzky too because it, it would have been just as cushy for him to sit here in edmonton like we said in an, with an office that he never has to visit he doesn't have to he doesn't have to do anything he doesn't want to do in this position and he's going to get his name on the cup when when the oilers do get it again right because he's a part of the organization so it's just it would have been a cushy job for him everything wayne gretzky does pretty much with his entire life since the day peter pocklinton sold him to the los angeles kings has been to try and better the sport of hockey and that's exactly what this decision does for me as as a whole like we said he's on tnt's broadcast now people are going to watch tnt's broadcast and be like oh yeah i know that guy you know and and then they can roll out some smart minds of hockey afterwards and also I see this just... being like i see this like being when he went to la and helped hockey as a player now he's gonna go back to the u.s and help hockey from from the boardroom and they can push the other wrong captain for the oilers Maybe they can and... put that him on another thing with uh ferentz if you believe and if you honestly don't believe that Wayne Gretzky would be back at Rogers place for an Oilers cup run whenever it happens like <laughs> give me a break Did you watch him before that dude is cheering louder than I do exactly Wayne Gretzky will be back at Rogers place and he'll just have a little TNT pin on now but he will still be cheering for the others all right just to wrap up the Deuce Vodka Cold performers of the week uh let me run here for a second uh I want to talk about this a little bit but I'll save it for the Cole performers the Iserman moment. One of the weirdest things that has happened after getting bumped out against Chicago in the plans, after getting bumped out against Winnipeg, is some of the old boys, they dig back in their old brain bank and say, listen, the Oilers aren't going to win anything until Connor McDavid has himself a Steve Eisman moment where he sacrifices offense in the name of defense. Until he does that, by crumb, there will be no wins here in Edmonton. Well, today at OilersNation.com, I wrote about the Eisenman moment. But what a lot of the talking heads don't really mention is that the last cup 
Steve Eisman won as a player with the Red Wings, half, soak it in, half of the roster went to the Hall of Fame. The 2001-2002 Detroit Red Wings featured Sergei Fedorov, Brett Hull, Nick Lidstrom, Luke Robitaille, Brendan Shanahan, Pavel Datsuk, Dominic Hasek, Chris Chelios, Igor Larionov, and finally, Steve Eisenman. That season, Eisenman finished sixth in team scoring, a sacrifice that I'm sure everyone would hang their hats on. Now, gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Could you imagine ever what would happen if Connor McDavid dropped to sixth in team scoring for the Edmonton Oilers? Well, let me tell you what happened. One, he barely played. Two, we got fucking problems. So this fact, this idea that Steve Eisenman just had this transformative moment, and that's why the Red Wings won, is completely nonsensical. Not to mention, those years where Detroit won, again, I'm looking at 2002, they were essentially the New York Yankees of the NHL. They spent $65 million that year when the average NHL payroll was $38 million. It also- sounded like a team you take around like throughout Europe during a lockout or something. Like, hey, guys, want to like, yeah. come jump on my team? Like Gretzky did way back in whatever lockout it was. Yeah, so- it's, like, it's like you look at it and it's just, okay, congratulations on spending nearly twice as much as everyone else and having 10 Hall of Famers. So if Ken Holland can go out and get eight more for the team to go around Connor and Leon, then sure. Why do they have to go back well, 20 years like this? Too? I was just like, going to say the runway is Ovechkin's pretty long. right here. Ovechkin's the story is, is right there. The like runway it's, is it's, still it's, pretty long for Connor if you're comparing him to Steve Eiserman. Eiserman took 13 years to win his first Stanley Cup. So he's got a few more years ahead of him where Ken Holland has some time to go and sign the entire Hall of Fame. And, uh, and then we'll make some magic happen. Steve Eiserman moment. Hey. And here's the last thing I'll say about it is just we need to stop with the Steve Eiserman thing. It's lazy. It's dumb. So lazy. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever when you look at the bigger picture. When you look at the roster that was surrounding Steve Eisman, to say that it was all him is completely disrespectful to those other nine players I said and the rest of the roster as a whole. If the Oilers, what's the cap this year, Tyler? 81 5? Something like 81 that. 5, yeah. yeah. If the Oilers could spend $160 million this year, <laughs> hey, I'd feel pretty good about it. But you know what? That's not the world we live in. And no offense to Zach Cassian, Gaetan Haas, or Josh Archibald, but we're not comparing apples to apples here. So stop with the Steve Eisenman moment. The Steve Eisenman moment is that he was a very important piece of an excellent hockey team. And that is not to take anything away from Steve Eisenman. He's one of the best players I've ever been able to watch live in my life. But stop. It's lazy. The Eisenman moment is my Deuce Vaca Cole Performer of the Week year the month however long you bring it up cold performer no god no god please no 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 (laughs) uh flipping the ledger to some positives tyler you're up first deuce vodka hop form of the week the fact that there is going to be a playoff game tomorrow in Montreal with fans in the building. It's only 2,500, but I'm kind of excited to sit down and watch Leafs and Habs with a bit of atmosphere in the Bell Center. I think it's kind of cool, and it shows that we are ever so slowly returning to normalcy here north of the border. So the fact that there are fans in Montreal. Also, I'm going to give a quick, quick shout out to my big boy, Alec Manoa, for his impressive debut at the Jays. But my hot performer are, is uh, the fact that there will be fans in Montreal. He's a hot guy. Dan, you're next up. Deuce Vodka Hot Performer of the Week. Well, we talked about it just before we got into this uh, Deuce Vodka Hot Cold Performers of the Week. But uh, I'm going to give a shout out again to Oiler fans in general for the response of what we heard about Ethan Bear. Um, you know, there is there is always going to be a few bad apples, quote unquote. But the, the fan base, instead of doing the, you know, the knuckle wrapping that, that, a lot of people tend to do in these situations. We just responded with a lot of support and love for Ethan and a lot of push for different things to go forward and and make this into a positive instead of focusing on the negative. So Euler fans, you get my Deuce Vodka hot coal or hot performer of the week. Put some respect on my name. Rick? Well, we talked about it on Tuesday and uh, it was a pretty positive thing in a pretty dark time. But mine will go to Bag Milk for all the work he did this year when it comes to the food bank and, you know, the beat cast and 
all that stuff and being there after every game, win, lose, or draw, eating whatever <laughs> weird shit people put in front of them. Um, that's, yeah, that's a serious commitment. So, yeah, that's a that's, that's very big knock this week. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate that. Again, uh, if you missed Tuesday, I just want to thank everybody again. We raised $1,300 for the Edmonton Food Bank. That goes a long way because they can stretch those dollars out. We're going to do something again next year along the same lines. I don't know what the cast will look like next year, but we'll definitely have a, uh, an Edmonton Food Bank angle on it as well. Just to wrap it up, my Deuce Vodka Hot Performer of the Week is Connor McDavid. Why? Because he has to answer these bullshit questions about him leaving. And when asked about it, he says, not the case at all. We have a great core. We want to see this thing through together. Leon Dreisaitl echoed the same statement. They were pissed off. The boys were fired up, but they did not step. Uh, they didn't make any excuses other than to say, we're going to be back. They're hungry. This nonsense is garbage. Connor isn't going anywhere. Can't wait to see you next year, buddy. I love the way that you answer the questions, even if you don't have to. Connor McDavid, Hot Performer of the Week. I like this right here. <sighs> A little bit calmer than on Tuesday, boys. Cooler heads have prevailed just slightly. A little bit. You know, the, the clouds are out. The clouds are out. It's kind of keeping the energy level down. Mm-hmm. A little rainy, I think. I'm not sure. It looks pretty windy out there. Rick, you Wh- bought the windy positivity, ball, though. I loved it. It's a good. It was a well, good dude, I'm, I'm, I'm always given a hard time for being optimistic and positive. You know, death was barely on a plane to Finland. I was telling everybody's going to be back in no time. Um, yeah, but, yeah, no, it was, I didn't want, want to be negative last on Tuesday, but it was just we. This is what it is. As a failure, we're better than this. We should be better than this. So we can't sit here and say, yay, yay, yay. We said that was bad and move on. Yeah, a lot of bright future coming ahead. The only thing I want to close on is we just touched on it briefly just at the start of the podcast. Joachim Nygaard just signed a six-year deal over in Sweden. Now, <laughs> we, talked about the, we talked about the negotiation period taken away. <laughs> when did Joachim Nygaard start working on this contract? You know, because the, the 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 body of the season, the corpse is still warm, buddy. All of a sudden, a six-year deal <laughs> in his pocket to go back to Sweden made me laugh, to be honest. It every, was just... time, every time he hit the ice, I think the years went up. It just, you know, they, <laughs> they couldn't deny it. They had, to, they had to keep offering more and more term for him. Six years. Wild. Joachim Nygaard. Yeah, isn't he? How old is he? We barely. Mid-20s? Right, like mid-20s? I think so. Something like that. I'll check it out. Usually, like, yeah, you just committed the majority of your seat of your. He's twenty eight. Twenty eight. So he, that takes until he's thirty four. So good for him. You know, mm-hmm. long. What you know, we once in a while, always in a while. What am I gonna Probably do with my nice Nagar jersey? <laughs> what am I gonna do with my Nagar jersey? I don't know. I don't know. If nobody else has anything else they want to add, we are gonna wrap this up. Episode 141 is in the books, and I want to thank Sherwood for the Giants. Get the dishes, Cornerstone Insurance, Deuce Vodka, and all of you, the listeners, for allowing us to enter your ear holes. We appreciate you. Share, subscribe, tell a friend. That's Oilers Nation Radio. Have a great weekend, everybody. Shout out, Joachim Nygaard. Best wishes. Thanks for listening to Oilers Nation Radio, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts. Make sure to follow us on all of our social media to stay up to date and never miss a podcast.